there's a piece of the moon on this table yes. that you've given me yes. uh, that we didn't have to pick up that arrived here. That's right. So how did a piece of the moon arrive here on Earth? So this chunk of the moon, if it were delivered by uh, the Apollo and NASA missions, uh, you and I would be guilty of a felony right now because it's illegal to own pieces of the moon collected by the Apollo astronauts. So don't even joke about that when you go over to Houston. This piece of moon rock was delivered via the old-fashioned way by gravity. So this was a uh, chunk of the moon, which is blasted off because the moon gets bombarded by asteroids and meteoroids. Some of them eject material from the surface of the moon into space. And it will then orbit the common uh, moon-Earth system. And it will then eventually enter our atmosphere. And if the piece is large enough and the trajectory is proper, it can land intact. And this one landed with a few uh, hundred grams worth, and they sliced it up. And then it was delivered via U.S. Postal Service to, to my house. So you can buy these pieces. And actually, you can buy a piece of Mars. You can buy a piece of Mars delivered by the same route. Now, what's so interesting about that? Well, if a piece of Mars can get here, a piece of Earth can get there, if some piece of Earth has some life forms on it, it could get there. And if that can happen in our solar system, it could happen throughout the galaxy. So I'm actually not of the opinion that there is life elsewhere in the universe, <laughs> at least technological life that we can, can see. I see this look of horror on your face. Um, I view it, <laughs> I am personally extremely pessimistic, would be extremely surprised. I'm, I'm just, I'm curious by the transition because you just said that life could have arrived from Mars or like from planet to planet by because of the meteorite striking it and so on. Yeah. And then you went to, you don't think there, there might be life out there in the universe. Technological life. Technological life. Yeah. Adv uh, yeah advanced intelligent civilizations. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So go on. <laughs> yeah. So that's a the generalization of what uh, the famous astronomer Fred Hoyle called. I, I know this is a PG 13 pocket. It's called panspermia. Mm. Panspermia. And, uh, beep that out, please. Yeah, yeah, please. And uh, that's the exchange of, of uh, you know, genetic life form material from uh, other reaches on Earth, which explains the origin of life on Earth, but not the origin of life itself, which I think is a much grander mystery and much more interesting. How did life get here? And you've talked with many eminent people about that. I'm not going to add that much, but but just thinking about the reverse process. Let's say life started on the Earth somehow uh, and then made its way out into the universe. Is there enough time for the whatever material went from Earth via panspermic direction, you know, spraying the love gun out into the universe? Did that then have enough time to incubate and go onto a planet that could support it? Certainly not within our solar system, which traveling at the meteorite speeds would require, you know, hundreds of millions of years. Then looking at the evolutionary history from bacteria to Bach, from, you know, rocks to Rachmaninoff. I don't know. I can do this all day. Oh, wow. That's pretty yeah. good. How do you get from those you know, very simple inanimate objects to life? I just simply think there's not enough time for Earth to seed life, technological life throughout the galaxy. I don't think there's any evidence for that. But so you, you really think that the origin of, of life on Earth is a really special event. Yeah, if it did originate on Earth. My question for those that search for life outside the Earth is what if you had a letter from God and the letter said, um, life didn't originate on Earth. Like, would you choose a different profession? Like, it, se it would seem hopeless. Like, in other words, we only have a sample of one. In fact, we only know of one conscious life form, let alone one planet that has life on it, right? But what if you knew for sure it didn't start here? That means that like, there's almost nothing about Earth that is um, originated. It didn't originate the life process. So to study purely the origin of life, not life itself, I think that's still fascinating. But how could we learn about, you know, the origin of, of remember, you have to go from inanimate object to a living object, whatever that definition of life is. And I'm not an expert in you know, many definitions, Max, Sarah, you know, many different uh, definitions. But but how do you actually go from, from, from inanimate to animate? It's a huge question. Yeah, but then you don't have to be the place where life originated yeah. to replicate the origin or to under like uh yeah that's one way to understand something is mm -hmm. to uh build it yeah but another way is to just observe it you don't have to truly re uh re-engineer re from scratch it, yeah. <laughs> so I, I you know i but then yes if it didn't originate on earth then your intuitions about the basic prerequisites of life are are yeah. off what's the governing principle Right, like may, what is, um, and then you could have just an almost an arbitrary number of possible, like 
if life didn't start on earth. So to me, that's exciting because it's like, we know even less than we thought. <laughs> the thing is it can prosper on earth though. Yeah. So maybe the origin of life is fundamentally different from the, the maintenance of life. Right, and maybe maybe the existence of the earth life symbiosis is critical. I think Sarah, and you talked about Sarah Walker, um, that it's a planetary phenomenon, et cetera, et cetera. So doesn't that make it less like, in other words, like not only do you need special life conditions to create life, but then sustenance of life, as you say, that also has to be maintained under very specific circumstances by very specific planets and with very specific tectonic activity and moon. And by the way, you need a Jupiter nearby. You need an Earth and a moon system so that you don't get bombarded too early. And I always think like this, like technological life, I haven't said this before really, so I'm just speaking. I usually like to write down before I say these different things. But one of the things I thought about Somebody is- Somebody hosts a podcast. <laughs> you should probably accept the fact that you're going to say stupid things every <laughs> once in a while. Not every once in a while, every, every <laughs> while. I claim that, you know, to get to sending, you know, people to the moon, you know, our planet needed whales and, and dinosaurs, right? Like you don't make a solar panel from another solar panel. Like you made a solar panel from a factory that melted down glass, silica, you know, aluminum, extruded that using fossil fuels. Where do those fossil fuels come from? Like, so any civilization that's going to be a Dyson, you know, a Kardashev, uh, spe- they, do they have dinosaurs? Like, do they have like prebiotic life? Do they have a great oxygenation event? Do they have a di- dimorphism between prokaryotic, eukaryotic? All those hurdles, let's say you give each one, let's say there's eight hurdles. And each one of those has a probability of one in a thousand to go from, you know, uh, eukaryotic, prokaryotic, whatever. Let's say that's a one in a thousand chance. I think it's like one in 10 to the 40th or whatever, if you really do it. But let's say it's first generous nature, one in 10 to the three. Let's say there's eight of those hurdles. That means you have you know, 10 to the to the, uh, to the the 24th power, <laughs> uh, different uh, pr- uh, possibility. And that's just with eight. Like the moon has to be there. Jupiter has to be there. Dinosaurs had to be there. All the different things that we have to get to technological life. There's only 10 to the, tw- only, there's 10 to the 22nd, we think, Earth, uh, not Earth, uh, planets in the observable universe, not the galaxy. So that's 100 times fewer than the probability <laughs> to get, you know, 100% clearing these eight very low hurdles of one in a thousand. That's fascinating, because now I really need to listen to your conversation with Lee Cronin, who I believe you had, yeah, yeah. because he believes the opposite. Yes, I know. Yeah, I <laughs> want to be- have a debate with him. He, he, be- he believes uh, that the the way biology evolved on Earth could have evolved almost an infinite number of other ways. So like if you ran Earth over and over and over, you would keep getting life and it would be very different. So it's the, the fact that our particular life seems unique it's just like, well, because every freaking life is going to seem unique, but and it'll be very different. It's not like we shouldn't be asking the question of what's the likelihood of getting a human-like thing? Mm. Uh, it, because that seems to be super special. It's more like, um, <laughs> how easy is it to make <laughs> Slime mold. A, a, anything that has the skills of a human? And, and I don't mean like something with thumbs, but achieving basically a technological civilization. And according to Lee, at least, it's, it's like, it's it's trivial. I know, we, we fought, a, I fought a little bit. I'd love to debate him, I think it'd be a lot of fun. Because we debate with love. When I talk yeah. with Lee, I love him and he loves me, I think, I hope. But let me ask you a question. I asked this of him and Sarah on a clubhouse once. So what do you think would happen the next day? Let's say we discover life. It's Proxima Centauri B. It's... um. It looks just like slime mold, like you got on your, you know, brie cheese or whatever. We discover it. What would happen the next day? And they were like, oh, this would be transformative. And, and, and I'm not trying to be like, you know, total Cassandra about this, but I said, I don't think anything would happen. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It would be transformational. I'm like, I stipulate that life exists. Go down to like the river, you know, I'm in San Diego, go down to the Pacific Ocean, scoop up a glass, mm-hmm. you know, um, you're going to find life in there. And what are we doing? What are we doing to our earth? We're destroying it callously. We're like pumping crap into there. Like we have this toxic waste spill a couple of months ago in San Diego, I couldn't go to the beach. What, what, let me take it a step further. Do you know how many, well, you know how many people, I'm sorry, that you do know, but how many people died in the 20th century? Killed. These are advanced civils, this isn't a slime mold. We kill, we maim, we harm, we hurt, we hate. I don't think anything would happen the next day. 
And we go back to what we had. And I said, if that weren't proof enough, life has been discovered at least two or three times just in my professional career. Once in 1996, these Allen Land Hills meteorites in Antarctica, this, so like microbial respiration processes. Still, we don't know. It was a press conference held by Bill Clinton on the White House lawn that's featured in the movie Contact. Um, we purpose for that movie. And um, and then there's uh, and then there's this um, the, this phosphorus life this this toxic life in the pools of Mono Lake many you know extremophile we don't give a crap we continue to so why are we thinking that like our salvation from whence will our salvation come as the Bible says <laughs> like it's not going to change how we are it's not going to magnify how I treat you or you treat me. And and we're pretty knowledgeable people, you and I, compared to you know lay people. Uh, okay, that's interesting. That's a really interesting argument. I I wonder if you're right, but I, my intuition is, uh, I can, I can maybe present a different argument that you can think about in the realm of things you care about even deeper, which is like what happens once we figure out the origins of the universe. Like, how would that change your life? Yeah. I would I, I would say there are certain discoveries that even in their very idea will change the fabric of society. I tend to see if there's definitive proof that there's life, and the more complex, the more powerful that the idea is no, elsewhere, that I'm not exactly sure how it will change society um, because it's such a slap in the face. <laughs> it's like a, such a humbling force, or maybe not, or maybe it's a motivator to say, um, yeah, I don't know which force would take over. Maybe it would be governments with military uh, start to think like, well, how, how do we kill it? <laughs> <laughs> if there's a lot of life out there, how do we create the defenses? How do we extract it? Or, or yeah, or, yeah, or yeah. mine it for mm -hmm. uh, for benefits. All those, I mean, I just see like uh, there's a hundred million literal counterexamples about, I mean, right now there's like, like 700 million kids in poverty and like, we just, how do we go about our life and just not deal with that? I mean, I look, I put it aside. I eat hamburgers and, I, you know, in a hundred years I'll be canceled for being a, you know, a carnivore or whatever. But, you know, so obviously to get through life, you have to make certain compromise. You're not going to think about certain things. But I, I, I just think there is a sort of wish fulfillment. Like every time there's water, why are we going to Mars and digging and flying this cool ass helicopter? I'm, mm -hmm. We're looking for water. Like stipulate that water was there. Like, I believe there was water. I think we should investigate and see what the geology was like. But but don't you think, so So you're saying- but Don't think you're going to get meaning from it. That's all I'm saying. I, I, I'm not saying it's not worth doing. I'm, I'm just saying there's a wish fulfillment aspect that people will find meaning for life from science. 